Harvey on Harvey. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, Marxist geographer David Harvey weighs in on natural and not-so-natural disasters and how we might organize our cities better to avoid them. And Tanu Yakupitiaga from 350.org explains why climate justice requires that we make movements that will reverse our policies on refugees. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. While no two hurricanes are exactly alike, these differences are largely due to economic, political, and infrastructural conditions. The wealthier the economy and the more sophisticated the physical and social infrastructures and the information streams, the better protected populations are from traumatic human losses, even when the property damage is far greater. Natural disasters are social and class events. Those are the words of Harvey on Harvey. Distinguished Professor David Harvey, that is, Professor of Anthropology and Geography at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, and the author of numerous books. He's been teaching Karl Marx's Capital for over 40 years, and he's no stranger to this program. With all manner of hurricanes, of the human as well as the weather sort raging out there, we thought it was well worth time for another visit. David Harvey, welcome back to the program. Glad Thank to have you. you. Yeah. So let's start with the top. What makes Hurricane Harvey, your namesake, a political, economic class event? Well, the very fact that uh, populations are prepared or unprepared to face up to environmental hazards of various kinds. And of course, there's always the point about the environmental hazards themselves are often bear the, uh, the, the mark of human intervention, climate change, and all the rest of it. But uh, what happens when something disastrous occurs is if there's a lot of good technology around, good information around, then people can be mobilized to, to get, take care of themselves or get taken care of, uh, such that there's not the same number of deaths as there are in uh, low-income countries like Bangladesh or Guatemala, as happened a few years ago in the Hurricane Mitch, where it was a rain event like, uh, uh, like this last one, and uh, it was... Uh, led to about 22,000 yeah. people dying. In Honduras and Nicaragua? Yes. Houston, obviously the center, but not the only place that, that, felt, that felt Hurricane Harvey's impact, um, has its own story as a city. Mm. A story of sort of out of control, intentionally deregulated development and um, fossil fuel exploitation. Talk to us about Houston um, before Hurricane Harvey. What did you see there when you looked at that city? I think what you would see is a, is a city that has uh, got a chaotic form of uh, urban development, uh, privatized. Uh, there's no concern about public spaces. Uh, the spaces are organized around the automobile. And when you cover spaces with uh, asphalt and concrete and all the rest of it, the rain comes down. It has nowhere to go except to rush off. And so you get the kind of uh, disastrous impacts that you saw in, in that particular city. And the human role in all of that? I mean, the decisions that get made or don't get made? We get told in this discussion since the hurricane, well, what did you want? No development in Houston. At least they were providing housing for people that couldn't afford housing in places like San Francisco, I think Paul Krugman said. Yes, well, you know, San Francisco is a special case, as we, as we know. And, uh, but in, in, in this instance, what you've got is a, uh, a private uh, development, which is you know, re really driven by corporate power and particularly financial interests and developer interests and uh, they just get hold of spaces and they build cities and for them uh, the whole building of the city is about building cities for them to invest in uh, not necessarily cities for people to live in and whether it's going to be an adequate living situation or not 
uh, most of the developers don't care because they've done the development, they've got their money, they've gone on, they go into the next block of land, they do the next block. And, and then when something like the, the hurricane comes, then they look around and say, oh, well, we didn't really think about that. And of course, if they did think about it, they would pretty soon find uh, some ways to turn that to profit as well. So it's about cities which are about profit, about investment, uh, not necessarily about creating good living environments for the mass of the population. So how do we do cities differently? Uh, do you see any models out there? I think there are, you know, there are cities that have had, uh, I think, and are increasingly subject to some very strong social movements, uh, where uh, even the social movement characters start to have power, they can start to change the forms of governance. Uh, Barcelona, for example, before the last tragedy, uh, was experimenting with assembly types of uh, organization of populations in which popular will um, becomes expressed in the urban environment rather than developer interests. So explain how that works. How do those assemblies work? Well, uh, you put people together and say, what is it uh, that you want? And this then creates a very interesting thing because the rich folk don't want any poor folk around, so you get a not in my backyard politics, which can come out of this. But then at a certain point, there has to be ways of putting the different you know, groups together and saying, well, the city as a whole is a nonsense when everybody says not in my backyard, because there are certain things that you need that you, you have to take care of. So, so again, it's a matter of at a certain point, people learning from each other and putting the assemblies into contact with each other and doing joint assemblies so that people get used to negotiating with uh, people that usually they don't talk to. Because cities are supposed to be centers of sociality, but actually they become full of gated communities and isolated mm. spaces and sort of defended buildings where nobody gets to talk to anybody other, other than people like themselves. And I think what we've learn in, in flood and hurricane after flood and hurricane that it's actually human con communication that uh, uh, saves lives. Yeah, People human, just knowing who their neighbors are. Oh, absolutely. And the other thing that happens in catastrophes of this kind, people suddenly realize the kinds of conditions under which some other people are living. And, and it is interesting also when, you, when, you, when everybody goes and starts lauding the, the popular response and how everybody really helped everybody else. I didn't see any rich bankers and I didn't see any of the rich wives of you know, Munyun Chin and all these people out there paddling around in, in, in toxic waste to help people. No, ordinary people help ordinary people and then ordinary people discover that there are some people who are very impoverished and they discover all kinds of things and, and then it, it has a, an impact on people's sense of responsibility for other people. And I think that's a really very important attribute of human populations, but unfortunately lacking in the very rich and ultra-rich. Yeah, I didn't, when um, Donald Trump said, I will put all of my resources at your disposal, he didn't mean opening up his hotel rooms. Oh, absolutely not. Uh, but the, you know, the rich do something, they give a million dollars to some relief fund and then kind of pretend this is, this is it. So would you have a favorite example? Do you have a favorite city right now? Would you say Barcelona is it? Well, Barcelona is a, a, a very interesting one. But I think actually in the United States, we've now got uh, city administrations, which are actually doing some very progressive things. Like look at, Well, Seattle, for example, passes minimum wage. Los Angeles has now moved uh, towards a, a, a more minimum wa livable, living wage. And, and so you're seeing a kind of a, an attempt, I think, to uh, get the city and start to turn it into something which is a place where uh, popular will has, has, has something to say about what, what, what happens. And I would like to see a lot more of that going on in New York. For instance, the community boards in New York are pretty, you know, dopey organizations, but they could be revived. And, and make the city a much more uh, kind there of people-oriented. There is people budgeting, budgeting yes. which is very popular. Yes, that's beginning to come in. So there are moves of this kind, which I think are trying to democratize what's happening in cities. All right, so talk a bit about the context in which that's happening, because it's interesting that I'm seeing the same thing as you are, and we're going to be talking um, this season about the Southern People's Movement Assemblies that are taking place in uh, North Carolina that grew out of the federal lack of response to Katrina right. and have been meeting and organizing right. to figure out how to meet people in the South, how to meet their needs ever yeah, since. Right. This local governance innovation, some people are calling it new municipalization, it's including things like deprivatizing things yes. that were privatized yes, yes. And, and that sort of thing. Um, it's happening at the very same time that at the national level, the federal level, even the international global corporate level, 
people feel not only less power and less ability to have a say, but they're actually up against fairly authoritarian right. rule. Right. Do you see those two things one as a, as a mutually reinforcing cycle? Yeah, no, I, I, but this is interesting. You know, at any particular historical moment, uh, the very rich folk go to that layer of government where they can exercise the most power mm -hmm. for their own benefit. Now, there was a time when, when uh, uh, the federal government uh, was not uh, doing the rich folks' uh, bidding. So the rich folks started to mobilize state governments, and that's when they started getting state power. And, and, and so, so then there was this kind of, well, we should have local power uh, because, we, you know, uh, we've got to deal with the federal government, which is, quote, socialist. Right. We always said the, the Reagan revolutionaries yes. started by running for dog catcher. Right. right. So, so this, there's that sort of thing. But then, but then what happens is that people kind of say, well, I can't exercise power at the federal level. It's basically bought by big business and all, all of money that goes into politics. Uh, but I can exercise some power in my, my local city. So people start to go to that space in which they can exercise some power. And so we've seen historically uh, different social movements go to different layers of government to where they exercise their power. And I think right now the left, if anything, is moving towards the municipal, local kind of level, uh, to some degree also driven by an ideology about autonomy and locality and all that sort of thing. Um, you're about to go, as we're speaking now at the middle of September, you're about to go to the UK to participate in a variety of events, yeah. some of which celebrating the one and a half centennial of uh, yeah. Das Kapital. Um, but some of them also participating in a discussion happening now around the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn. Yes. You'll be attending the World Transformed Conference, which I saw when I looked it up was about, this year was ad addressing mechanization yes. and technology yeah. and what they're calling right. post-capitalism. Oh, yeah, How well, do those two go together in your mind? Well, I don't. Uh, I mean, a lot of people like to talk about uh, post-capitalism, and I'm afraid we're not there at all. So you're going to be the voice of doom at the conference? Uh, no, not necessarily. I think I'm going to be a voice of reality and say, that, look, uh, there's no technology that has been invented that capital hasn't found a way to take advantage of. So artificial intelligence comes in, uh, automation came in, uh, small-scale batch production came in. Uh, what happened? Capital seized upon it and turned it into a way for itself to uh, progress and leave people behind. So uh, unless you actually mediate this idea and say a post-capitalist society is one in which the, the struggle between capital and labor has disappeared, well, I don't see that happening at mm -hmm. all. And I don't see these new technologies uh, actually uh, making it happen for technical kinds of reasons. And uh, actually Marx has a wonderful kind of thing in one of his chapters in Volume 1 of Capital, which is what we're celebrating, where he kind of says that you know, John Stuart Mill had a very real problem. He couldn't understand why it was that machines that were supposed to lighten the lay the load. Load of, the load of labor end up making the conditions of labor much harder and much worse. And he couldn't understand why that would happen. And he kind of said, well, there's a very simple reason, because as far as the capitalist is concerned, it's not about lightening the load, the, the load of labor. It's about uh, making more and more profit. Uh, and so you know, that's why I would be have great skepticism about that somehow or other this new technology is going to usher in an era of uh, uh, post-capitalism. So you said it's a matter of negotiation still between capital and labor. We're seeing that with respect to the so-called sharing economy as people who work around Uber say, wait a minute, not, it's, this isn't so liberational, liber liberatory. Right. Um, we're seeing that around um, the new warehouse yeah, economy absolutely. that's taken yeah. over from manufacturing right. really. Right. It's about distributing. Uh, 3D printers, probably next. Right. They won't right. liberate every right. neighborhood. Right. Um, what do we need? When you say negotiation, what do you mean? Well, I'm not sure it's negotiation uh, so much as it is uh, actually dealing with the class relation and the, and the foundational role of the class relation and the way in which uh, technologies get applied and developed. I'm, I'm, I'm not a Luddite in the sense that I want to see no new technologies. Uh, but I think uh, I am very much in favor of saying, well, what kinds of technologies are going to be able to really transform social relations and what organizational form? Because technology for Marx was also about organizational form, forms of cooperation, and that's where something like Uber comes in. And it looks like it's a great idea. Airbnb looked like it's a great idea, democratizing things, and then all of a sudden, 
twit, and it, there, there it is, and somehow or other you've got a hierarchical stuff, and some people are extracting vast profits from very hard work, which is done by a massive labor force, which then thinks it's doing it voluntarily. So this is, this is the, 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 the trick, and until people focus on what the real problem is of capitalism, which is capital, and what capital is about, until there's a theory of capital in everybody's heads and says that is the problem and that is what we've got to confront one way or the other or transform or whatever. Until we can do that, I don't think we're going to find any technological fix to our, our problems. All right. If you want to think more about capital and learn more from David Harvey and his reflections on dust capital and more, not to mention here about his new book, Marx, Capital and the Madness of Economic Reason, check out our website. We're going to have an interview on that subject with David coming in a few weeks. A new study by Cornell University finds that roughly one-fifth of the world's population could become climate change refugees by 2100. The majority of those will be people who live on coastlines around the world, including about two million in Florida alone. Escalating refugee migrations, rising waters, and hotter-than-ever summers may appear to be different crises, but in reality they are rooted in a joint emergency, says today's guest. We better start addressing them simultaneously. To that end, Thanu Yakupitiyage came from New York's Immigration Coalition to work as the U.S. Communications Manager for Climate Justice Organization 350.org. She is clearly a connector. She's also a DJ. Danu, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thank you for having me. So um, this is kind of an interesting transition for you, going from immigrant rights work to the work that you're doing at 350. You were doing communications at both organizations, but what's changed? What's your new? Um, you know, I think uh, for me, I've been in the immigrant rights movement for um, a decade. I forever and always will consider myself a part of the immigrant rights movement, but I think I wanted a change. And I also wanted to work on um, things um, that had to do with broader broader impact because a lot of my work at the New York Immigration Coalition was around like, you know, the specifics of how do we like help support people to stay in New York, the, the tangibilities of like healthcare and education and access, which is so, so important and clearly continues to be important during the Trump administration. But I'm also really, uh, I think it's important to, to take a step back and really think about why it is that migration happens. And I uh, wanted to create space for myself to do that. And so I transitioned to 350.org because, um, you know, I have a, a previous uh, background, uh, you know, growing up within the environmental justice movement in Asia. I'm from Sri Lanka and Thailand. Um, my dad does work on sustainable agriculture, and I just really think that this is the time to be connecting the dots between two of the largest issues um, that are facing all people. We are big believers in connecting the dots here on the Laura Flanders Show. Um, but before we go there, for a lot of people, they think about the migration crisis, the refugee crisis, and they say, well, aren't wars causing those crises? Yeah, absolutely. So that's one of the ways in which we need to think about um, the refugee crisis is like, or refugee crises are the multiple factors that actually lead to a refugee crisis. So if you even look at the situation in Syria, actually in 2008 or 2006, there was a major drought that happened in Syria. And that really impacted farmers in a lot of parts of Syria and caused all of this migration from um, the rural areas into the urban areas. And that was also one of the catalysts of um, you know, the Syrian refugee crisis or one of the, the catalysts for the conflict. And so when we look at what ha what's happening in Syria, certainly it's about war, but there's multiple factors that led to that situation. And so some would argue even that like the Syrian refugee crisis also actually has to do with climate. Yeah, I mean, it does seem as if our immigration, migration, refugee crises, all of which are somewhat different, are kept very separate from every other category, whether it is um, industrial policy or trade policy, or as you're talking about climate change policy, we don't want to talk about movements of people in, in connection with any of those things. Why? What, what, what do you, whose interest is being served by us keeping everything so compartmentalized? I would say nobody's interested in being served, <laughs> but okay, um, right. you know, I mean, even the term climate refugee is actually a really contested term. A lot of people won't use the term climate okay. refugee because um, they feel like they still can't tangibly state, well, it's climate that's causing 
these people to migrate. And so I speak about it as um, you know, climate impacts, as climate related migration, because it's always a, a number of factors. So even if you look at um, East Africa, you look at Chad, Sudan, one of the reasons why people are getting on these boats and crossing the Mediterranean, Mediterranean is because the conditions in their countries are unlivable now. Yeah. Drought, famine, um, which leads to political crisis, which escalates political crisis. And so um, even though people don't want to say that's a climate refugee, it is part of a climate impact. Yeah. No, is there a danger in, I mean, it's already, climate is already a big enough problem that some people feel overwhelmed. I know I sometimes do. Uh, is it dangerous to make it even bigger, like, if, you, if you know what I mean? I mean, yeah, the climate in and of itself is extremely overwhelming, right? When people, you know, talk about climate change, even myself, you know, prior to being in the climate movement, I'd be like, oh, wow, that's bad. It really is getting hotter. And people don't know what to do. And so I think we're really in a moment where we really need to think about what we mean by intersectionality beyond just saying the word, right? And so it's really important for people in the climate movement to really show up for the immigrant rights movement. It's really important for people in the immigrant rights movement to show up for the climate movement. Now, what about the steps since the climate march? What's been going on? Um, it did not stop Trump from exiting the Paris Climate Agreement, and we saw that happen um, in early June. But I think that what it's done is really um, intensify people's commitment to climate. Um, when you have an administration that is just rolling back any progress mm. we've made. Um, and so, you know, since then we've seen, you know, hundreds and hundreds of mayors, governors um, really stand up um, and say that they're gonna take on, um, you know, the Paris Climate Agreement and meet the measures. And what we, what we that's great in, you know, theory and that's great in um, rhetoric and so really, the role of organizations like 350 is really to hold them accountable. Yeah, because it does seem like now what we have to do is have people say, now all people need to do is say, I'm for the Paris Accord, yeah, which exactly. most of us were not happy with in the first place. Exactly. And they're suddenly climate heroes. Yeah, and I think that that's something that we have to be careful about because I think there's been this like narrative over the, um, the last year of, uh, well, we're not Trump. Right. Um, and yet, you know, even if you look back at the Obama administration, you know, the whole resistance against the Dakota Access Pipeline actually happened during the end of the That's Obama right. administration. Um, a lot of major pushback against deportations happened during the Obama administration. He was considered the deporter in chief. Not over just two considered point the statistics were he deported more people than anyone. Exactly. Over 2.5 million people were deported under, under, under Obama. And so I think that we need to actually really transition out of the, the rhetoric of resisting Trump into actually what that looks like mm. tangibly in action. All right. So two things. One, what does that resistance look like tangibly in action? It was interesting to me that I saw one of the articles you'd written on The Root and in the comments section, wow, there's a lot going on. You have people saying, African Americans don't care about climate, they don't even drive hybrid cars. Then they had a comment about people saying, well, but this is, you know, white people have only been concerned about the Dakota pipeline and they didn't even show up when we were being shot in the streets. Like, how you bring these movements together and these communities together is clearly the work that you have taken on. How do you do it? I mean, this is the thing. Movements are messy. Movements yeah. are not uh, linear. Um, there's a lot of building that goes into that. And there's a lot of mistrust, um, understandably. And I think that it really takes people coming to the table over and over again, even if you get burned, in order to build a, a real movement that is multiracial, that is multi-issue, that really is beyond the buzzword of intersectional. So just thinking intersectionally for a second, I'm thinking about the way that we enforce our response to climate change, at least historically, that's been with government action, government regulation and inspection. If I'm thinking intersectionally about a population that's already over-policed and maybe doesn't have the most positive re relationship with federal officials or government officials, um, what does that, as it were, enforcement look like on the climate front? I mean, I would say that there's a lot of local initiatives that it's not like, you know, when we talk about um, changes that we need in our communities, uh, communities of color are already making those changes. And so it's, it's not, and communities of color are also very wary, for example, of police presence. And so it's not to have it in, in, enforced in a, in a top-down way. I think there's a lot of um, you know, just a lot of education that needs to happen um, in order for communities to really advocate for themselves. 
Um, and I think, uh, so one of the campaigns that 350 will be launching in the fall is a, is a distributed local campaign, um, which is about um, communities all across the country really meeting, um, you know, pushing towards 100% renewables, uh, keeping no fossil fuels in the ground, and, and stopping infrastructure. And that's going to look different in different places. And we're a global organization, so what we do in the U.S. is not what it looks right. like in India or in Japan. So what can people do if they want to support your, and I'm, I know you're not alone, in, in this effort to really change and bring issues together and movements together? and have a real impact, what, what can they do? Maybe they've been supporters of 350 or they've been sort of mainstream environmentalists. How can they get on board? Well, first of all, go to 350.org and follow our work. But I think also like follow the work of other in, um, immigrant rights organizations. Um, ask questions um, to these organizations about how they're bringing different movements together. Um, you know, I, I, like I, I recently heard someone say, well, you know, I have no time to deal with racial justice because um, saving the planet is a large enough task. And what I would say to that is that um, this idea, this meta idea of saving the planet actually requires that we figure out how to live and work together and create um, spaces that of less oppression. And so I don't think that these things are as separate as, as people like to, to put in their heads. I think you're right. <laughs> Danu, thank you so much for coming and it's great to thank meet you. Thank you so much.